everyone. Um, so welcome again to Agape Latte. Uh, Jack Dunn is the Director of News and Public Affairs, University Spokesman, and Adjunct Professor in the College of Arts and Sciences. A graduate of Boston College, he holds a master's degree from Boston University. He lives in Milton with his wife, Hazel, and four children, Siobhan, Sinead, John, and Brian. Uh, thanks again for being here with us, Jack, and please join me in welcoming Jack Dunn. Well, thank you very much for having me. I am absolutely honored to be here. Grateful to all of you for extending me this invitation. In particular, I want to thank Karen Kiefer for her, her amazing energy and vitality and making Agape Latte such a success that it is. Karen Kiefer, everyone. Let's hear it for Karen. <laughs> Eric Goldschmidt, who has brought such vision to C21. Eric is a visionary, and we're blessed to have him at Boston College. Eric Goldschmidt. And a special thanks personally to the members of the, C of the Agape Latte Advisory Committee who met with me for lunch and helped shape my remarks tonight. I'm grateful for them for the energy they put into this, for making this wonderful celebration of faith a reality here on Boston College. For the Advisory Committee, let's hear it. Okay, so tonight I want to talk to you about reconciliation. about liberating ourselves from those things, be they pride or sin or guilt, that get in the way of our experiencing God's love for us. Why did I choose this topic? I chose it because in my 16 years at Boston College, when I meet with students, I always get the same answer. How are you? Great, great. Couldn't be better. Things are fine. Perfect. But when you take the time to push back, to get them to open up to you, I often experience students who are suffering, sometimes suffering in silence, over regrets because of mistakes made, sins committed, promises broken, high expectations unrealized. And if left unattended, these issues can fester in a way that can only cause harm. And so I want to talk to you about the importance of letting go, of liberating yourselves from all that, so that you can be free to live the life that God's calling you to live, free from the burdens, free from the regrets, free from all that stuff that we as individuals possess. Because that's what God's calling us to do to be happy to live a life to a fullest, but it begins by reconciling those issues that are getting in the way. And I chose tonight to share with you an intensely personal story, something that's very dear to me, an experience of the past few years involving my closest friend that I want to put out there tonight for you as an example of how I myself have taken this journey and benefited from it. So that's my intention. Sound like a plan? All right. So to begin, a little bit about me. I'm, I grew up in an Irish Catholic family here in Boston. Okay. My parents weren't educated, but they believed in education as being the great equalizer. And in the Irish Catholic world of Boston, it was Jesuit education into which people put their faith. So for my parents' sacrifice, I got a BC education. And when I graduated from BC, I thought for a while about joining the society. I was so impressed with the men I had met here. Maybe I'll become a Jesuit, I thought. But on the very night that Doug Flutie threw his famous pass, I met the girl who's now my wife. Isn't that amazing? I once said to Doug, if you'd thrown an interception, I'd be a bachelor. But <laughs> he threw his pass. I was so excited. I got up the nerve to ask a girl out. I had no right asking out. We got married, had four kids, and I get to come back to my alma mater and serve here at BC as its spokesman, as its public voice, advocating for and defending my alma mater. Who could be more blessed than I? I have the best job in the world. I get to defend and advocate for something I truly love and believe in. So life is great, right? Who could ask for more? And then as so often happens, life gets in the way. 
all of us experience challenges and setbacks. In my own case, they came in the form of a series of horrific, horrific losses, deaths of people who were so close to me that would shake me to the core of my faith. When I was a freshman at BC, I was walking through campus during that uh, student activities day. I'm thinking, do I join the Heights? Do I join a theater group? And for whatever reason, I noticed a table to the right on the Dust Bowl, and it was the Big Brother Association of Boston. I don't know why I was drawn to it, and I walked up and talked to the man. He said, we're looking for college students, mentors, men who'll give five hours a week to fatherless boys, to a fatherless boy from Boston. I was drawn to it. I signed up, and I was given a little brother named John. John's father had abandoned him and his brothers on Christmas Eve the year before. He was shy, untrusting of males, and it took a while to break through that veneer, but eventually we developed a friendship that became a bond, a bond of love. I loved him like he was my brother, like he was my son, and I was so proud of him. John went to South Boston High School, worked hard, graduated, got a scholarship to Northeast, and one night he was saying, Jack, I'm thinking maybe I'll go to law school when I graduate, and I'll get a job and be successful, and I'll pull my mother out of the public housing project in South Boston where we're living. And I was just so proud of him. Four nights after that dinner, John was stabbed to death on a street fight in Boston. Oh, I felt like a part of my soul had been ripped from me. I mourned his loss. And then inexplicably, as sometimes happens in life, it began a series of losses for me that I couldn't understand. My friend Glenn, who I'd grown up with, was taken two years later by a drunk driver. Almost two years to the day after that, Tommy, who I'd grown up with, was died of cancer. Two years later, I lost Andres. When I was a junior at BC, I'd done junior year abroad in Madrid, and Andres, my Spanish friend, was so kind and welcoming. He'd been such a force in my life. I would lose him to complications from AIDS. And then just two years later, my friend Paul was found dead on a park bench of alcoholism not far from the neighborhood where we used to play as boys. All these losses within a small time frame. And I remember, as shaken as I was by all of them, I felt I have my faith, I have my family, and I'm still so blessed because I have my best friend. My best friend is going to get me through this. My best friend was a guy from New York City named Nick Javaris. We had met at grad school on the first day. We were roommates. I'm an Irish Catholic kid from Boston who loves the Red Sox. He's a Greek Orthodox kid from the Bronx who loves the Yankees. I said, we're going to kill each other. <laughs> who thought of this? But all of us have that one friend in our life who we know completes us, who, who gets us and can help us through anything. And he became for me that friend, that friend that I relied on to get me through those dark days of loss. We just had so much in common. We'd both taught high school history. We'd both been high school coaches. We'd both become college administrators. Blue collar kids from working class neighborhoods. We just understood each other. And one day he called me and he said, I have great news. I've just been given a job as the executive vice president at the American College of Greece. And I was so happy for him and proud of him because he had always wanted to return to his ancestral home and perfect the language that his parents had spoken in their life. And so while I was sad to lose my best friend, I was happy for him. And he agreed that he'd come back every six months and I'd see him. And I looked forward to those visits and they were always wonderful. And then the six month came for the third visit and he showed up at my house and he looked awful. He looked sick, he looked thin, he looked tired. And so I approached him, I said, what's wrong? He said, it's stress, I'm just stressed out. I'm working too hard, too many hours, too much stress. So I gave the best friend pep talk lecture about, hey, find the balance. We've got to find the balance in life. And he promised me he would, that he'd come back in six months and he'd be better. Six months went by and he walked through the door of my house and I knew something was tragically wrong, tragically, tragically wrong. He, he walked with a limp, his hands shook. And when I handed him a tray of food to bring down to the backyard for the barbecues that he so loved, he handed it back saying, I don't think I can carry it. My wife's a nurse practitioner. The next day she got him an appointment with the doctor that began a series of 
visitations and referrals, both here and in Greece, diagnoses that eventually, months later, led to the horrific conclusion that my best friend had amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, a terminal illness that would take his life in two to four years. I was devastated. I remember thinking, God, this is it. I've tried to keep it together. You're losing me. Ignatian spirituality talks about spiritual consolation and desolation. I was being pulled into desolation. The evil spirits, the good spirits that wrestle for control of our soul, I was losing. I still went to mass, trust me. That's ingrained in me. But my heart wasn't in it. I felt numb. I was just going through the motions. My kids, we'd pray at night because that's what we always did. But my heart wasn't in it. But I knew I had to go to Greece to be with my friend, to let him know those things that sometimes we make a mistake not to share. So I went over. And on the last day of my visit, I said to him, look, there's something I need to tell you. I love you. And I've cherished every day of my 30-year friendship with you. And I need you to know, all the, of all the people in my life, you're the best man that I know. And he said to me, look, I love you too. And I know I'm going to die. But I need you to know I'm happy. I'm at peace. And we'll see each other again in the kingdom. Wow. It was the most profoundly beautiful thing a friend had ever said to me. The kingdom. Here I am, angry at the world, falling apart. He's undergoing the, the most horrific of illnesses, the cruelest of illnesses. And he's happy. He's at peace. And he's thinking about the kingdom. I promised him I'd get back as soon as I can, maybe four months, maybe six months. And I fulfilled my promise, and I went, and I noticed how much he had declined in that short time. He was no longer able to walk on the walk that I had brought him. He was confined to, to a bed in a chair, bed in a chair. And on my last day, I said to him, I can't explain this, but I need you to give me an assignment. I need you to tell me something that I can do for you. It would do me wonders to do something for you. And he said, there is something. And I said, anything, anything at all. And he said, I want you to go to confession. I was shocked. I thought he was going to say, run the marathon, start a scholarship, find a cure, paint my house, anything. <laughs> confession. And I don't know why, forgive me, but I hadn't been in confession in years. I hadn't. I just couldn't go there. I went to Mass faithfully every Sunday, but I couldn't do the confession thing because I was angry. I felt that I was owed more than I was getting, and I just couldn't go there. So I went home, having made a deathbed promise to a dying friend that I would go to confession. And I do what guys always do, right guys? We procrastinate. I put it off. I put it off until the week before I was to leave. And at Mass, they talked about a diocesan program called Leave the Light On, where they'll leave the light on on churches from 6 to 8 o'clock in the Archdiocese of Boston, and you can go and seek reconciliation. So the Wednesday night before the Thursday of my flight, I show up to fulfill this promise. And I go to the first church, my own church, in the town I live in, and I walk up the stairs, still not quite feeling the vibe, still not buying in, but knowing I have to do it. And I walk in, and it's the pastor of my church hearing confessions, and I say, Time out. Ain't happening. <laughs> I know him. He knows me. It's too, it's too, it's too personal. Yeah, personal. And I wimp out and I go to a different church. I go to a church on the other side of the town I live in, and I walk in, and the format is you'd go into a room, you'd shut the door, and you'd sit face to face across from the priest. Didn't like it. Too, too, too informal. Yeah, that's it, informal. I'm out of here. And I left. And I drove to a different city. This could be a comedy movie. Someday someone's going to put this in a movie. I pull into this church. I'm sitting in the pew, awaiting my turn. And I look over to my right. And into the church walks the mother of an ex-girlfriend. Girl <laughs> I had dated at BC. And I'm thinking, I have like 20 years worth of sins. I'm going to be in there for a half an hour. She's going to see me come out. She was from Ireland. And all I could picture of her was calling the ex and saying, 
I saw that no good boyfriend of yours at church last night, and he was in there for 30 minutes. 30 minutes worth of sins. <laughs> it's a good thing you dumped him when you did. So I leave. I go to another church, Sacred Heart Church in North Quincy. And I walk in, and there's no one in this huge cavernous church right? except an old lady and I. And I walk in, and she goes into the confessional, shuts the door. But since there's no one else but for the sound, I can hear everything. I felt so embarrassed. It was just typical elderly confession. I was two minutes late for church because of the blizzard. Please forgive me, Father. <laughs> And he's saying, say that again, just a little louder, say that again, dear. And I'm thinking, I am going to confess for the first time in 20 years, and I'm going to have to do it twice. <laughs> Forget it. So I leave. <laughs> and I get in my car, and I drive, and I come to this church, St. Anne's Church, St. Anne, the mother of the Blessed Mother. And I walk in to St. Anne's, and as I'm going up the stairs, the lights go off. I look at my watch. It's 8.30. I've blown my chance. Six to eight. It's 8.30. I can't believe it. I have blown my chance. And it was miraculous. The priest looks out and sees me, realizes there's someone on the steps, turns on the light, opens the door, goes into the confessional, turns on the light. And I walked in, and I said, bless me, Father, for I've sinned. It's been 20 years since my last confession, and I'm only here because I promised my best friend that I'd do this. So please forgive me. Here are my sins. And I let it all out. 20 years worth of sins, regrets, mistakes. I let it all out. And when I finished, in the kindest of voices, the priest said to me, you have to understand that God loves you unconditionally. He loves you unconditionally, and he accepts your transgressions because he made you, and he understands you. And God wants more than anything for you to be happy. So all this baggage that you've had, all of this... All these things you've been carrying for 20 years, let go. Let go. Because God wants you to be happy. And all he asks is that you go forth and do your best to sin no more. I thanked him, and as I got up to leave, he said, and one more thing, you have a hell of a friend. So I leave, and I can't explain it in any other way, but I felt like the burden of the world had been lifted off my shoulders. I felt light. I felt weightless. I felt liberated from all of that burden. And I went home and I kissed my wife and my kids and I got up the next day and I flew to Greece to see my friend. And he had worsened so much he could no longer speak. Such a cruel illness. He was just on the bed. But when I walked in, his eyes lit up. He could speak with his eyes and I said, Nick, I have something to share with you. I went to confession, and I feel beautiful. I've never felt better. I feel absolutely liberated. And he burst into tears. Why am I telling you this? What's my point in all of this? Why did I choose to share this intensely personal story? I did it because I want you to realize that if an imperfect sinner like me can find peace and reconciliation, I promise you, I promise you, you can too. What I learned by doing the spiritual exercises upon my return is that God wants to have a personal relationship with us. He wants to. He wants to let us find a way to let him in our life. If only we'll let him. But it's we who puts up the obstacles. Because we're afraid, because we have fear, because we're proud, for whatever reason, we put up obstacles that prevent God from coming into our lives. All we have to do is to let go, to reconcile those issues in our lives, to let go so that we can let God in, so we can live our lives to the fullest, so we can help create his kingdom here on earth. That's what he desires, if we'll only let him. But it all begins with letting go, with letting go. May each of us here liberate ourselves from those things that get in the way of experiencing God's love. May all of us here find it in our hearts to seek forgiveness 
from God and from ourselves. May all of us realize that ultimately God wants for us to be happy. And in the end, may all of us see each other again in the kingdom. That's my talk. Thank you and God bless. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was incredible. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for sharing your story. Appreciate it. Um, thank you. Does anybody have any questions? We can now open it up to some questions and answers uh, for Jack. I really want to say thank you. I think it was very explicit and very direct. Um, obviously, it's because it's a pattern that you've been able to see working here um, amongst our generation and other people that you've been able to be with. And thank you, really, for making yourself so vulnerable in order to teach us and grow. So we really appreciate it. Thank you for those kind words. I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank Hi. you so much for coming tonight and talking. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And tell me your name. You're Josh. Josh. And where are you from? Um, Cleveland. Cleveland. And your name? Sorry. Kimberly. Kim. And where are you from, Kim? I'm Brockton now. Kimberly from Brockton. Can you talk more about, you said um, at one point you were talking to your friend and you knew, you know, he was diagnosed and he was going to, he had a, a deadline almost. Yeah. He's going to die. But he was a piece and you weren't. Correct. Can you kind of elaborate on that? And like, why was he feeling that way? Why were you feeling that way? How did you come to terms? Um, um, it's an excellent question. If Ignatian spirituality talks about consolation and desolation, it talks about being pulled in the direction of peace and tranquility, consolation, or being pulled in the direction of despair, desolation. And I didn't understand that until after my experience with him, is that he had found his peace. He had moved in the direction of consolation. Even though sometimes our bodies abandon us, God's always with us. And he'd come to that realization. He had lost control of his body. He lost the ability to, to speak, to raise his hands, to walk. But he was at peace because he realized that he was going to experience eternal life with God. And it brought him a profound sense of happiness. And so realizing how despondent I was, he wanted me to join him in consolation. And he realized, even though he's not Catholic, he's Christian, he realized that to do that, I needed to confess. I needed to be free from those sins so that I'd have a chance to experience eternal life that was so important to him. I guess if you have a terminal illness, you tend to look at things in the broader scope. You tend to look beyond the temporal. And he was doing that. But it took his experience, his bravery, his insight to get me to understand what I couldn't have understood on my own. Hi, thank you. I'm Kimmy from Boston. Hi, Kimmy. Um, how was your grieving process after he passed different from your grieving process after all of your friends passed? And was it just as hard because he was your support through all those years? Kimmy, what's amazing is he's still alive. He's still alive. And um, I'm thinking maybe of going um, right after Christmas. It's hard because I realize he doesn't speak, he doesn't move from the bed, he's, he's barely alive. He's, ALS survivors tend to live two to four years and he's at four. So I'll be honest, Kim, when the fo phone rings at night, I always assume the worst, but he's, he's still alive. Um, what's amazing is there's something called assistive technology that enables people to blink out messages who can't move their hands. Part of it was invented here at Boston College called Eagle Eyes years ago by two amazingly gifted professors, and they gave it to the world for free. So he has a variation of it, uh, a Greek version of it, if you will, and uh, we communicate through blinked messages. So I'm just grateful every day that I have him. Uh, and I'm at peace now with the realization that, that he will die because he's shown me that he can live in peace with his inevitable fate, because of his, his own faith in God, because of his own belief, and because of his, his calling for eternal life. So it's brought me a tranquility that I never experienced. My wife said to me that she noticed I'm calmer, that I seem to take things better in stride. I think uh, he helped me to understand the need to do that. So as I said, it all begins with letting go, and I'm eternally grateful to him for 
for showing me the way to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Hi, Hi Katie. Professor. Hi, I have Katie in class. She's a star. A star. Thank you. So I'm just thinking about sudden loss, sudden death, right. and I know that you've experienced this, and I'm trying to think about applying this letting go to that, right. but I'm still having trouble. Just, like, how do you let go of those feelings of anger or that this isn't fair, deep sadness? Katie, that's such a human emotion to say, I'm angry at the world. That's how I felt. I felt all these losses had given me a right to say, I'm pissed off and no one's going to tell me otherwise. But I've come to the realization that this is just a, this time on this earth, this God-given life of ours is, we're mortal. We're all going to die. We're, we're mortal. So we have to make the best of it. So I say to let go so that you can enjoy your life while you have it. Because life is precious. I've seen firsthand how often people that I love have been taken from me. You know, five of those guys were ushers in my wedding. And 20 years after my wedding, they're all gone, except for, for Nick, who, who will die soon. So I realize you, you have to let go because life's too short. And you have to find a way to realize that as difficult as things are, sometimes it's God's way of challenging us to remind us that there are people who have far less or people have, who are worse off. But we have to keep our eyes on the ultimate message, which is God gave his son Jesus to experience the most horrific of deaths himself so that we could have eternal life. And that's what we need to remind ourselves of. Let's face it. Guys, we don't walk around talking about, hey, you think about heaven today? It doesn't come up. We don't do that. We just don't do that. But we need to. We need to be reminded of the fact that everything we're doing is a test run for eternal life. And we need to let go of those sins that prevent us from letting God in. And since I've done that, you know, small things. Spiritual exercises was a great opportunity for me. If you ever get a chance to do it, I highly recommend it. The examine of conscience. I brought that home to my kids, and they're like, okay, dad's on his Jesus freak thing, you know? <laughs> now they do it, they love it, they love it. It's been a soothing experience for all the kids in my house, for my wife, for me. I love it, I love it. So there are things here. Wednesday night, Manresa House. There's a plug for my friend, Father Terry Debano. You do the examine of conscience every week here. You can do it in your dorm room, you can do it yourself. So I found that by doing that, it's given me an opportunity to, to be free, to be liberated, to be at peace. And that has made all the difference. Yeah. Trust me, I still have my days. I still yell at my kids. I still lose my temper. I still get mad at the Patriots, the Bruins, not the Red Sox. <laughs> Been a great year for the good guys. So, and no one's perfect. And trust me, I'm not. Please don't take away, wow, this guy has all the answers. I don't have the answers. What I've figured out is how to process the questions better. And I feel that I'm at peace to try to listen to what God's calling me to do. That's what I've, what I've discovered. Please. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Um, my pleasure. My name's Owen. I'm Hi, from Owen. Vermont. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on what, what it was about your friend that made him so important to you, even before he, he uh, was diagnosed with ALS. Um, Oh, and I hope you have a best friend, and I hope that all of you meet that one person in your life that you just sense understands you better than anyone else. Oh, I admired him. I admired him the night I met him. Just, just a great guy. Oh, granted, we had a lot in common, similar upbringings, similar, similar backgrounds. But he was honest. He was hardworking. He... When he'd ask, how's it going? He really wanted to know. And when I suffered these tragedies, he'd be the first to call and say, Jack, I heard the news, and I, I want to let you know I'm here for you. Oh, what a great friend. I guess that's all we need, right, is someone to be there for us, someone to pick us up in these moments of darkness. And he was just a great guy to, to go out with. I'd go to New York City, or he'd come here, and we'd just have the best nights, guy nights, you know, sit in the bar, watch a Red Sox Yankees game, you know, sit in the backyard of my house and barbecue steak and look at the 
look at the sky and talk about life. And because we had all that common background of having coached sports and taught history, there was just a, a common bond. But because of his honesty, because of his decency, because of his humanity, he was, and I, I'll say this to the end, the best man that I, I, I've gotten to know in my life. He's, he's the best man I know. Take one more question. If anybody else has one. He asked, I'm, I'm sorry, your name? Uh, Brian. And where are you from? Canton. Brian from Canton asked if there was a time in my faith life when I had an instantaneous change or was it just a gradual realization? In my own case, it was definitely a, a, a gradual realization. All of these things finally came together for me. You know, I'd been blessed, and, and I had to endure challenges that tested my faith to the point where I realized that I'm fortunate to have my faith. I'm blessed to have it. I need it. It sustains me. Otherwise, I was taking it for granted. I really was. And so it wasn't as if a light switched on, but rather a series of events that convinced me that I had to look differently at the world and my place in it. I had to change my relationship with God. When I did the spiritual exercises, eight days of silence, I'm a spokesman, silent for eight days. My wife was laughing, saying, you're going to be quiet for eight days? This I have to see. <laughs> I went up to Gloucester. I spent eight days of silence and prayer. And what I learned from that experience, as I said earlier, is that God really does want to have a relationship with us. And it's hard. It's hard to begin that conversation. Jesus, it's me. You want to talk? <laughs> it's hard. But once we started, we realized... It's easy to do, because if we believe that God truly loves us, then we know that we're talking to someone who loves us unconditionally, someone who wants our friendship, like a best friend. And so it was gradual for me, but it's become profound. And then when I screw up, I don't have to wait 20 years. I can say in an exam of conscience at night before I go to bed, I had a crappy day. God, you wouldn't believe what I did today. We all say that, right? But now I'm saying it to God, <laughs> and it's a lot easier. And I, I feel better about it. I feel better about my life. I, I'm just happier, happier. Even though I've experienced a lot of tragedy, I feel happy and I feel blessed. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. And I owe that to, to God and I owe that to Nick for showing me the way to that peacefulness. And again, please don't think for a minute I have all the answers. I don't. I struggle. But I found a way through reconciliation of making sense of it all. And that's what I ask of you, to find what you need to find to be at peace. And if it means letting go, then let go. Hi. Oh, hi, please. I'm C. Chen. Hi, um, C. Chen. Hi, I'm from Pennsylvania. OK, uh, okay. so um, I understand that your friend was suffering a lot. Nick obviously was suffering from his disease. Do you think that if he could possibly have ended his life, he would have ended it? And also, what do you think is the importance of suffering, if any? Oh, it's an excellent question. I remember he said to me, I'm going to live out my life. I'm going to die a natural death. And in the Catholic faith, we believe in the sanctity of life. And I remember thinking, I understand why people would have a different viewpoint when you see someone that you love suffering like that. But even though he was suffering, he seemed so much at peace. It, it got me to think differently about that issue of, of ending one's life. I, it convinced me that you know, maybe he has a point. D definitely he has a point, that, that he's leading the life and dying the life that he's chosen. And that he's at peace with it, makes it hard for me to, to argue the other viewpoint. So his suffering has been painful, painful for me because I love him. And you don't want to see anyone you love suffer. But it's also been, in many ways, inspiring because of the humanity with which he's approached it because he never complained, never. If anyone had a right to, he was a phenomenal athlete. Nick was a baseball star at Columbia University and just a great, great athlete. Uh, and so to be robbed of everything. One night when I saw him, he had 
cut um, bites on his face. And I said, what happened? He said, there was a mosquito in my room last night, and I couldn't swat it. And I was so angry you know, that somebody that you love would suffer. And he didn't have the ability to raise his arm to, to strike away the mosquito. So I lament his suffering, but I'm inspired by the way he withstood it with his faith intact. And I'm inspired by his message of uh, resilience and faith in God and belief in peace that comes with eternal life. So overall, I think the word I'd use is I'm inspired by it, if that makes any sense at all.